Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. Now the videos that you're watching are intended for use by students who are enrolled in my courses, but if anyone else out there in the uh, inner Google land and YouTube land or whatever finds them helpful, please hit like and subscribe. You can follow with more videos. Um, now, the series of videos we're doing right now is going to be the chemistry videos, and this is for my part one or biology 2401 uh, anatomy and physiology course. If you're in my class, you're following along in the notes set, we're going to start on page 12. We're going to be talking about the four major organic compounds that make up the human body. And we're going to do the chemistry in a manner that I find suitable for my students to understand what they need to understand now. I could go into all the technical detail and be extremely precise uh, and technically accurate. But sometimes I lose students along the way, especially those that don't have a strong chemistry background. So as time goes on, we will tighten up the language and we will learn where we utilize all these molecules and their importance and we'll, we'll tighten up all those details that some people don't like that I'm very loose with early on. So anyway, um, this is my take on the four major organic compounds. So the human body and pretty much all living organisms are made up of the same four major uh, classes of organic compounds. Organic compounds, if you were in part of the last lecture, know, you should know that all organic compounds have both carbon and hydrogen, and usually oxygen, but not always. They don't have to, to be organic. If you're lacking carbon, if you're lacking hydrogen, one, the other, or both, it's not an organic compound. Now, those four major classes of organic compounds that make up our body each have specific functions. And as I go through each one, I want you to know three things. I, need, I want you to know, are there alternate names for them? Some of them go by several different names. Secondly, what atoms are found in each one of these? And thirdly, I want you to know their functions in the body. What are they primarily used for? Now, this is a very simplistic overview of a very complex topic. So forgive me if I keep it overly simplified for now. We'll introduce the complexities as we begin to understand the human body and get deeper into physiology. Okay. So now, the four major classes of organic compounds. The first one we're going to talk about, and I'm going to start with part of this up here. So we have four major classes of organic compounds. And I'm going to switch markers because all my black markers are actually starting to fade and I'm going to use purple. The first one that we're going to talk about is called carbohydrates. Now, if you just look at the name, if you begin to be observant, you'll see that they have carbon and hydrogen in the name. And the eight refers to, uh, in chemistry, can refer to the negative ion of an acid. And these all tend to be negative acids once they ionize. But we're not going to get into that. Now, carbohydrates go by several different names. They are also called polysaccharides. Okay, sakar means sugar in some Middle Eastern language. Sakar almost looks like sugar. So polysaccharides simply means many sugars. Another way to say the same name is to call them complex sugars. Okay, so now, a little bit of chemistry or background for some of this information. My simplified abbreviation for a simple sugar is going to be this. If I have a little S with a circle around it, we're going to call this a simple sugar. Simple sugars are individual units of sugars. The term, the, the suffix mer will mean unit. If I say monomer, it means one unit. A dimer would be two units, trimer would be three, tetramer, pentamer, hexamer, septamer, octamer. But after about three, we just simply start to call them polymers, poly meaning many. So a polysaccharide is really a polymer of simple sugars. It's many simple sugars strung together. Or if you think about this, if, you, if someone has a house and you live in a garage apartment behind the house, you're in a single unit. If you live in an apartment that's connected to all these other apartments on several floors, and sometimes there's many different buildings, we call that an co apartment complex. Every individual apartment is a single unit, but together they make a complex of units. 
So that's what we mean when we say polymers of simple sugars or we say complex sugars. So essentially what happens is if I take a simple sugar and I stick it to another simple sugar, I have a dimer or what we would call a disaccharide, two sugars. If I stick three together, it's called a trisaccharide. Um, if I start to stick a whole bunch together with all these chemical bonds, and I did so in sort of a 3D fashion so that we end up with this three-dimensional chunk of sugars, almost like you guys would look at, you know, maybe a cube of sugar. Then I now have a polysaccharide. I have many sugar units all, everywhere where these lines intersect would be sugars built up together. This would be a complex sugar or a polysaccharide. Now in nature, Mother Nature stores sugars as polysaccharides. Here's what the importance of sugars are, are, are for, by the way. And before I get there, let me just say, tell you this. All the atoms found in here are going to be carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. All simple sugars and all polysaccharides have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in them in some form. Now, when I look at a simple sugar, the arrangement of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, at least for the ones we're going to deal with for now, the simple sugars we're going to look at for now are going to have this chemical formula, C6H12O6. In chemistry, that means I have six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. And when I put them together in a specific fashion, I get what's called a simple sugar. A simplified example would be if I gave you, um, say, six yellow Legos, 12 red Legos, and six green Legos, and ask you to assemble them together, the different Legos representing different atoms, you would come up with a simple sugar, okay? Now, if I gave the exact same combination of Legos to another person, and I asked y'all to assemble them in separate rooms. You might take the exact same building blocks, the same six carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, but they may be arranged slightly differently from one person to the next. I would have two different simple sugars. If I had a third person assemble the exact same building blocks, they might come up with a different combination and permutation or orientation of them. So now I would have three different simple sugars. If I ask you to copy your exact same one, I have two of the same simple sugar. I have a different one from this student and a different one from this student. So all of the simple sugars that we're gonna talk about right now, at least the six carbon sugars that we're gonna discuss, have the same chemical formula, C6H12O6. There's more than one of these simple sugars, but they all have the same, the same chemical formula. It's the order and the arrangements of the carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens that make each one slightly different. Now, here's a chemical equation I want you to learn, and you should know this because it's gonna tell us the important functions of polysaccharides, okay? If I take this compound in the presence of oxygen, our cells are gonna run them through an organelle called mitochondria. We have not discussed mitochondria, we haven't even discussed organelles of the cell yet. But if, they run, if I run them through a mitochondrion, what I get out of the other end of these is a molecule. I'm going to get 36 of these molecules called ATP, which is energy for our cell. Okay? We're going to get some water. We're actually going to get six waters. And we're going to get six carbon dioxides. Okay? Now, we don't typically write these chemical equations vertically. We would tend to write it running across the board, but because of my camera, my screen is somewhat limited. But C6H2O6 plus six oxygens running it through mitochondria in our cells will have chemical reactions. There are enzymes inside the mitochondria that rearrange all these atoms and give us 36 molecules of ATP, six molecules of water, six molecules of carbon dioxide. And this is what we want out of it. We want as much energy out of one molecule of glucose or simple sugar as we could possibly get. There are three simple sugars that have this combination of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. One of them is glucose, and we're gonna primarily talk about glucose. Glucose is one of the most um, abundant simple sugars in nature that our cells convert into energy. Um, there's another one called fructose and another one called galactose that have the same chemical formula but we don't get as much energy out of them and it's a different chemistry. Nonetheless, this is what you need to know. 
Simple sugars, C6H12O6, like glucose, combined with oxygen in the presence of mitochondria, give us 36 ATP, some water, and some carbon dioxide. This is the carbon dioxide we exhale into the universe. This is the oxygen that we inhale from the universe. And by the way, trees inhale our carbon dioxide and exhale the oxygen. So whatever our um, waste is from breathing, trees use that and spit out the oxygen so we are having this sort of symbiotic relationship. That's a whole other topic. So the importance is this. When you do eat simple sugars, let's say you eat a meal that has a lot of simple sugar. Let's say you drink a glass of orange juice that has lots of glucose in it and your body needs to burn a certain amount of energy. If you take in more glucose than your body needs to burn to accomplish that tax, that task I should say, the extra glucose does not get wasted. Mother nature is efficient. So rather than pee it out or have it come out the other end or whatever, our body will store the extra glucose. It's kind of like this. If I gave you $100 to go to the nearest um, fast food place and buy me a meal, let's say it was $7 and you got $93 in cash left over. If I told you do whatever you want with that, what do you do? You don't leave it on the counter or donate it to them. You don't just throw it out in the wind or out your car window. You might take that $90, $93, and say maybe take $13 and put it in your pocket and take the other 80 and put it in the bank for later. So you can burn what you need, and if you run out of energy later or run out of money, later on you can tap into your savings. So the way that plants and animals store sugars is as carbohydrates. In a plant, we often call this starch. Starch is nothing more than a carbohydrate or a complex sugar. In an animal, it's called glycogen. And we as animals store the excess glucose that we have in our body as glycogen in our liver and our skeletal muscle. So whenever we eat, we burn what we need to make the amount of energy need to do, needed to do what we do. If we have any extra sugar left over, our body can undergo the chemical reactions to combine all those simple sugars into carbohydrates. So here's what you need to know about carbs. Carbohydrates are made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They are complex sugars or polysaccharides, meaning many of these individual simple sugars stuck together in the large molecules called a carbohydrate by all these chemical bonds. And if we can't eat for a few days, but we need energy to go looking for food, then our body can break down the carbohydrates. We can have enzymes digest the carbs to release the simple sugar, <coughs> excuse me, glucose that we can convert into energy. So the function of carbohydrates is that's how we store the energy in our cells. We store the sugars as carbohydrates so that we can release them for cell, cellular energy. Those are the three things you need to know. They're made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They are also called polysaccharides or complex sugars. And that is how we store the simple sugars. And eventually we break those simple sugars down into energy. So when you run out of fuel, your body taps into the glycogen stored in your liver and your muscles and starts to release that sugar so that you have enough time to make it to the next meal. If you've ever watched the TV shows like Naked and Afraid or Alone where people are stranded in the middle of nowhere and they're starving, their body is breaking down all this excess carbohydrates and releasing it so that they can go chase down the next rabbit or go fishing or go searching for berries and nuts or whatever. So that's it for carbohydrates, okay? They are polysaccharides or complex sugars, big chunks of simple sugars stuck together in chemical bonds. We, we um, store them that way so that when we need energy, we can digest them and release the glucose or the simple sugar converted to energy. They're all made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Got it? Good. I'm going to erase all this, and we're going to go on to the second major organic compound called lipids. And I do these in a specific order for a reason. Okay. Now, the second major class of organic compounds that we can look at is going to be called lipids. Lipids are fats, oils, and waxes. If it exists in nature in the form of a fat, 
like the fat on our bodies, like the fat on bacon or some animal. If it's an oil, like vegetable oil, like motor oil, like the oil that comes out of the ground, like crude oil, or if it's a wax, like earwax or beeswax, those are lipids, okay? Now, all lipids are made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They're made out of the exact same stuff that carbohydrates are made out of. When while carbohydrates are lots of simple sugars strung together, a lipid very often can be many carbons, much more than six, sometimes 12, 18, 24 carbons, lots of hydrogens and oxygens. They're very large molecules very often. One of the most common ones that we'll talk about is gonna be the triglycerides, which you know have three glycerol molecules struck together. It's a large carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen molecule. Now, here's the importance of lipids. Their function is this. They are used to form organelle and cell membranes. And we're going to go over this concept more than you ever wanted to in your lifetime in the very near future, probably in the next lecture, one of the next two lectures. But ultimately, when we talk about the organelles inside of the cells of our body, our body are made up of these little units called cells, and within the cell are small structures that scientists first thought were organs, like a stomach, a liver, and a spleen, but it turns out they function differently. So they call them organelle, which means little organs. And inside the cell, all of these organelles, many of them, not all of them, have a membrane around them. And that membrane is usually a bilayer of lipids. So anytime we're going to form these biological membranes to form the membrane of an organelle or the cell membrane, the outer covering of the cell, they're made out of lipids. That's their primary function. A secondary function is this. They are an alternate source of energy. So, I can break down sugars, since they're made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, or if I run out of sugar, my body can begin burning the fats, the lipids. We store excess sugar in our body as glycogen in our liver and muscles. But when our glycogen reserves become completely full, Mother Nature still refuses to lose the extra sugar and can convert the sugars into fats. Oddly enough, it is the overconsumption of sugars that is making America fat and obese and not the overconsumption of fats. You need some fat in your diet for a number of reasons, but it is the overconsumption of sugars that are causing obesity as a pandemic in America, or as a, I shouldn't say a pandemic, but an epidemic in the United States. So they, we can burn those fats as an alternate source of energy. Um, and that's kind of one of the secrets to many of the diets that are out there, by the way. If you see the Atkins diet, the Mediterranean diet, the paleo diet, the keto diet, all of them simply have you cut out carbohydrates, breads and pastas and all those heavy sugary things. You cut all that out, your body will burn up all the excess sugar that you have and then start to burn the fats. And then once you get down to the whatever it is that you want to get down to, then you reintroduce the healthy carbohydrates and maintain. That's kind of the secret behind all of those things. Because first we use the sugars for energy. When we run out of sugar, we start burning fat. Cut the sugar out of your diet and your body will start to burn some of the fat for energy when it's necessary. So those are the three things I want you to know about lipids, by the way. They are also called fats, oils, and waxes. They're made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and we have two functions for them. The primary function that we want to use them for is to, to repair, grow, and form membranes and so that our cells can grow and repair damage over time. But if we run out of sugar, we, we, we can't not function. You die without energy. We can start burning fats for energy if we need to. They're an alternate source of energy when we run out of sugar, so to speak. Okay? That's it for the lipids. The next major organic compound I want to talk about is going to be proteins. Proteins are polymers, or another way that we should say this is, we should say they are long chains of amino acids. 
One of the things you know about these molecules is they are acidic in nature. So all proteins are long chains of amino acids. They're made up of these simple units called amino acids. Now in nature, there are 20 different amino acids that make up all the proteins in your body and in all living organisms. Now, what makes one protein different from another is the number and the order of those amino acids. For example, I have all these colored markers here. Let's say I have 20 different colors, purple, blue, a funky red, red, light blue, all these different colors, black, green, brown, pink. If I have 20 different colors, but I got tens of thousands of purples and tens of thousands of each color, then I can start to take these different markers and string them together in an order. And sometimes I might wanna put two of the same one next to each other. If I start to take these individual, oops, sorry. If I start to take these individual amino acids, each marker, and I string them together into a long chain, I'm forming what's called a polymer of amino acids or several amino acids strung together, which would be called a protein. By the way, another name for a protein, let me write this down here, is it can be called a polypeptide. And the reason it's called a polypeptide is because each amino acid can also be called a peptide. Amino acids are peptides. Now, I have one polypeptide here, many individual amino acids strung together, one, two, three, four, five, six. I can take another molecule, another group of amino acids, and if I string them together to form another polypeptide, I have two proteins or two polypeptides, each of six amino acids, but each one has a different order and arrangement of the amino acids, so I have two different proteins. So essentially what I want you to take from that is, all proteins are polymers or long chains of amino acids. There are only 20 different amino acids that we know of that make up our proteins, but we can make up tens of thousands of different proteins by the different number and order of amino acids that each, and some amino acids, I'm sorry, some proteins are very short. Some are around, you know, 50 or so amino acids, like insulin is a short protein or short polypeptide. Some can be several hundred amino acids long. That's what makes one protein different from the other. Now, which atoms are found in all amino acids and proteins? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and I'm going to put in parentheses phosphorus. No, it's not. Come on, Ray did. That's in uh, nucleic acids. Sulfur. There are two amino acids that have some sulfur, so I put the S in parentheses. But all amino acids have at least carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and then there's two of the 20 that have some sulfur in them, okay? So now, the third thing we need to know is what is the function of proteins? And this is sort of my Mr. Long definition for this, but proteins are the functional molecules of our cells. What that means is this. If there's some function performed inside the cell, it's usually performed by a protein. We have proteins that get strung together like this in long chains, and they function almost like tent poles inside of a tent. They can make up the skeleton, or what we call the cytoskeleton of a cell. Cyto meaning cell, anyway. So our cells can make different shapes. Some are sort of amorphous, some are very cuboidal in shape. Some cells have funky star shapes. And the shapes of those cells, there would be a nucleus inside every one of them. The shape of the cell is dependent upon the order and the arrangement of some of these proteins in there, which form the structural or the cytoskeleton of the cell. They make, there are structural proteins that make up the skeleton of a cell. Some of the proteins are involved, involved in biochemical reactions. So when I say the functional molecules of the cell, some are structural, like the cytoskeleton, which we're gonna talk more about in the future. 
and some are what we call enzymes. Enzymes are involved in biochemical reactions. They're proteins that help speed up or regulate biochemical reactions. My, my handwriting gets messy when I get close to the bottom of the board because it's hard to write down there, but they are involved in biochemical reactions. For example, Whatever takes individual sugars and strings, to, strings them together into carbohydrates are enzymes. What breaks the carbohydrate down into individual sugars? Enzymes. What helps break down carbon, uh, I'm sorry, simple sugars and oxygen into energy? Enzymes. What assembles um, some of the lipids together into larger molecules are enzymes. What moves an organelle from one side of the cell to another side of the cell are some of the proteins inside of our cells. So all the functions or many of the functions inside the cell are very often performed by proteins, either structural proteins which give cells shape and organization or enzymes, proteins that are involved in the biochemical reactions inside the cell. So those are the three things I want you to know about proteins. They are polymers or long chains of amino acids or peptides, also called polypeptides. They're made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. A couple of them have some sulfur. And finally, they're the functional molecules of our cells. They perform a large majority of the cellular functions, like structural proteins forming the skeleton of the cell and enzymes performing all the biochemical reactions inside the cell. That's it. That's all I want you to know for now. Finally, I'm going to erase this and we're going to do the nucleic acids. And I'm going to simplify them because we're going to spend a lot of time on some of these other uh, molecules doing a little bit more chemistry when we get into how the cell functions, okay? I did a race where it says the four major organic compounds, but the fourth one of the four are gonna be called nucleic acids. They're acids, we know that they have a pH less than seven, they would release hydrogen ions when in solution, and they were first discovered in the nucleus of cells, so they were called nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are polymers, or we could say long chains, of nucleotides or we could simply say they are also called polynucleotides. So suffice it to say that in nature there is this structure that is called a nucleotide. I'm just going to put NT with a circle around it for one nucleotide. There's different types of nucleotides. Okay, There's, there's going to be several different ones that we can look at. If I take all these individual nucleotides and I string them together into a long chain of nucleotides, then this would be a nucleic acid. If I break the, com the, the chemical bond between them, then I would have individual nucleotides. That's all that they are. They're polynucleotides. We're going to talk about what a nucleotide consists of in another lecture when it's important. The atoms that are found in them are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and now we have the P, which stands for phosphorus. It has to have these things in it, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus, in order for it to be a nucleic acid. And what makes one nucleic acid or nucleotide different from the other is the arrangement of all these atoms. The function of nucleic acids is rather simple. And I'm, I'm not going to go too into detail because we're going to do a whole series of lectures on nucleic acids. But the function of them is that they store and transfer genetic information and that may not mean a lot to you guys but what it means is this there is some information that gets transferred when we have a, a say a certain cohort of a certain age when we have offspring, we will be one generation, our offspring will be the next generation, and then their offspring will be the third generation. And the information that gets passed from one generation into the next, that helps tell the cell which proteins to build and what are the order and the arrangement of the amino acids, is gonna be the information that is transferred from gener generation to generation, so they call it the genetic information. 
That's where the term gene and genetic came from, from the word generation. So, when my wife and I had our children, if you look at our children, you can tell they belong to my wife and I. They have a little bit of my characteristics and a little bit of my wife's characteristics because some of the information that we transferred into that generation is the genetic information. It is the nucleic acids. The nucleic acids, particularly one of them called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is the instructions on how to assemble all the proteins inside the cell. So I don't just randomly assemble amino acids and hope they make up a protein. In order to make a specific protein, I have to have a specific number and order of the amino acids. How does the cell know what order to put the amino acids in? The genetic information called DNA is the instructions that says, hey, put the light blue amino acid first, put the red amino acid second, put this order of amino acids together and you're done and you form this protein. If I wanted to build another protein, then I would have a, a different set of instructions that say start with the green one, then put the brown one and the black one, and then string them all together. So we call that the genetic information, the DNA. And that information can be transferred not only from generation to generation, but also within our cell. So what happens sort of in a nutshell is this. Within the nucleus of the cell is this nucleic acid called DNA, and it's the instructions on how to assemble any and all the proteins inside the cell. If my cell needs to build a protein to perform a specific function, then I can go find that gene, and there's a uh, I can go to that chunk of DNA that gives me the instructions on how to assemble that specific protein one amino acid at a time. Now, the guys that are actually going to build the protein, there are organelles in the cell called ribosomes. Where, again, we're going to cover this in the future. The ribosome isn't going to just randomly assemble amino acids. It needs to know exactly what order do the amino acids go in. So I can actually rewrite the DNA into another molecule called RNA, specifically called messenger RNA. And then that information can be sent out to the ribosome and he just has to build that one protein out of the messenger RNA. So we can transfer the genetic information, not only from generation to generation, but from the nucleus of the cell to another organelle called a ribosome to tell it, put these amino acids in this specific order. I need you to build this protein and build it now. So that's all that I want you to know about nucleic acids for now. One, you need to know that they are called polynucleotides or long chains of nucleotides, that they're made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus, or phosphate, we should say it's an, it ionizes. And it is how we store and transfer the genetic information within our cells and from generation to generation. That leaves a big open-ended question, I know, and we're gonna cover that information eventually. So this is what I want you to know about the four major organic compounds of the human body. No carbohydrates, what atoms make them up, what are some alternate names, and what is their function inside the cell. No lipids, what atoms they're comprised of, know what their um, alternate names are, and know what their functions are inside the cell. Proteins, know which atoms are found inside proteins or peptides, know that they're also called polypeptides, and know their functions in the cell, and the same thing for nucleic acids, okay? All right. Um, I hope you found this helpful. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I hope you learned something. Now do it till you can't stand it and do it till you understand it and you can explain it to the next person and you'll be ready for the exam. Thanks for watching. We're gonna move on to the cell in the next video and start understanding how a cell works by putting all these molecules together to form organelles to form the cell and see how cells function, at least at a basic understanding. See you in the next slide. Thanks.